The point of these two uh, lectures is, is really this. Harry Blackman said when I came, I was, I was appointed after, he said, you know, I, I wish I'd, I'd uh, written down what I'd learned over the years. You know, so I thought, well, I might try. You know, that, that is a risk. I mean, that is a serious risk because uh, you end up like the, the famous George Bernard Shaw, you know, who told the judge, the judge said, my God, he said, I have to deliver everything I know about law in the commencement speech next Friday. What will I do? And Shaw said, well, speak very slowly. <laughs> uh, the, 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 but, <laughs> so, so, so there is a risk in this. And uh, in a sense, what I'm going to do today is, is sort of like a, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. This is sort of the sugar and tomorrow is the medicine. And what I'm trying to do is put down in a form that people will understand, and not just law students, uh, but people who aren't lawyers, aren't law students, what I find so moving and so significant about being in the job that I've been in the last 15 years. I mean, I see in front of me every single day people of every race, religion, color, point of view, whatever. And I've told this story 4,000 times. And Joanna said if she hears it once more, she's walking out. <laughs> so don't walk out. But, the, but the, <laughs> the point is it's true. And my mother, this is another part of the story, uh, said that uh, uh, because we were from San Francisco, uh, when you say, she said there's no view so mad that there isn't someone in the United States who doesn't hold it. And then she said they all live in Los Angeles. But the, the, <laughs> the, 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 point, the point is we do see in front of us everyone. And they're there to decide things that are dividing them under law. I can say that about 5,000 times, and it's pretty hard to capture the emotional content of it. So what I thought I'd do in this first part, you see, the first part tries to capture the emotional content of that. And the second part says, well, what should the court do in order to be sure it's still there 10, 15, 20, 25, 50 years from now? The answer is we can't do much about it, but we could try. And so that's tomorrow. Today is to try to give an answer that I give often uh, to a question that's often asked. I'll see judges from South America. I'll see judges from Africa. I see judges from around the world who come to our court. They want to see our court. They've heard of it, and they want to see it. And nine times out of 10, I will get the following question. Well, why does it work? And after they've heard the argument, they really push that question. What, why in heaven's name does this work? I say, well, the Constitution, I say, I take it out usually, that's impressive. I say, well, well, why the Constitution? It's a small document written in very general words. After you've been there for a while, you can summarize the main points. And I usually summarize them by saying, uh, look, uh, uh, it uh, creates in those seven articles, uh, it creates a, a set of institutions that are basically democratic institutions. They're there for uh, people who are citizens of the United States and can vote to choose the kind of government they want. It's basically about democracy. Now, it's a certain kind of democracy. It's a democracy that protects basic rights, certain ones. It assures a degree of uh, equality. It uh, divides power horizontally, three branches, vertically, state, federal, so no group of people become too powerful within the government. And it insists upon a rule of law. Right? And the rest is sort of detail, filling that in. I say, well, it is a special kind of democracy, and those principles have helped us. And that means that what we do in the court, we don't say what people should do. At least that's not how we see it. What we see it is that that court, that constitution, is a creating a set of boundaries. And we are like the boundary patrol. We're like the frontier police. We're trying to keep this system on the rail. Now, life in the frontier is anyone who grew up as we did and used to listen. Who was that person, the Mounties, somebody, Sky King of the Mounties or something, <laughs> who was on the radio at 515. He was out on the frontier. And life was tough. It's not so easy on that frontier. And they're very difficult questions. Which side of the boundary does abortion fall on? Which side of the boundary is school prayer? Which side of the boundary is this or that? There are a lot of difficult arguments that divide people enormously. But it's important to remember that it is a boundary. 
And within those boundaries is a vast area where people, in fact, make decisions for themselves, how, through their elected representatives, about what kind of community they want on thousands and thousands and thousands of topics. So let's not get mixed up about our relation to the whole system. I would say we're basically the boundary patrol. And I've explained this to many, many of these foreign judges who say, actually, you know, that isn't really what we're interested in. I say, well, what are you, what, what are you interested in? Why do people do what you say? <laughs> that they want to know. Why do they do it? We're the boundary patrol. Great. But uh, we're nine people, and uh, there are a lot of distinguished judges here. We can add them in, add Guido in, <laughs> add others. We may get 900, 90, 920, uh, maybe 1,000, add a lot of judges. Still, it's a small number. Why do people, particularly when we do decide things like abortion, that's just a very, very mild, unemotional matter that goes to the heart of about 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, or 70 percent of how people feel in the United States, strongly. And we do decide that. And people do it, roughly. Why? That's what they want to know. One of them said, oh, we think it's the, U oh, you control the U.S. Marshals. I like the U.S. Marshals. They're very decent people and they do their job well. Uh, but I don't think even they could bring about enforcement of the Supreme Court opinions if, in fact, people were not willing to do it. So what is it I really want to tell those judges, those judges from Latin America, the judges from Africa, the judges from other parts of the world, who want to know the secret. I want to tell them that there isn't much of a secret, but there is a lot of history. And I'd like to illustrate that in the next 30 or 40 minutes, skimming through three or four cases so that you can see what I see from my seat on the court as an America that hasn't always been like it is at the moment in respect to how people feel about court decisions and the law. Now, there's approximately 50 or 60,000 books on the subject of where did the Supreme Court ever get the power to start reviewing acts of Congress and holding them unconstitutional. And probably of the 50 or 60,000, 59,832 think it probably is a thoroughly bad idea, or at least not as good an idea as some other people in writing other books thought. Now, I have not read all those books, but I've read a little bit about it. And it seems to me that uh, we are there in a world where we do have this power, but how did it come about? Well, I've learned two things from that very ancient history, from reading uh, a few things that others have written. And the first is, why did Congress, no, the President, no, Alexander Hamilton, well, we're getting warmer, uh, the founders, why did they give the court the power to set aside acts of Congress, to have the last word about was, was or was not constitutional. So when I read that, I discover rather interesting debate. And this is only my view, but it seems to me in my view, most of those founders thought that the court would have the last word, at least in some areas, at least as to some parts of the Constitution in some situations. And they thought someone has to have the last word. Read Hamilton again and again and say, do you think that the court should have the last word about whether an act of Congress is constitutional? I think you'll come to the conclusion he says yes. Say, why? Why? Why do you think that? What's so great about the court? They're not even elected. And I think he says this, nothing, nothing is so great about the court. It's just that the others are worse. <laughs> Suppose we gave the power of having the last word to the president. My goodness, he could become a dictator. He could do anything he wanted. Hmm. All right, let's give it to Congress. To Congress? Hmm, <laughs> this document is meant to keep Congress in bounds. This document, in part, is de designed to protect the least popular person in the United States when all of the others want to tyrannize over them. And do you think that Congress, that has just passed this law, which just ruins some individual, 
because it's popular to ruin that individual? You think that Congress is going to turn around and say, oh, the very law we passed is unconstitutional? He says, I doubt it. I doubt it. They are subject to the popular will immediately and to shifts in the popular will immediately. And that causes a problem. If we're going to give them the last word, we risk not having the, the, those boundaries in this document enforced. Now, who does that leave? Well, the Interstate Commerce Commission had not been founded at that time. <laughs> but who does that leave? That leaves a nice group of people, actually. We love them. Very decent, underpaid. But none, nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless, this group of people called judges, says Hamilton, first, they're pretty technical people. Pretty technical. And they're not likely to cause too much trouble. They don't have the power of purse. They don't have the power of the sword. And they basically do their job. And they won't hold laws of Congress unconstitutional too often, he thought. And uh, so let's give it to them. Fine. We'll give them the power. And I think many, many of the founders were thinking that way. But they didn't write it into the Constitution. It doesn't say a word about it. There's nothing in this document that tells us who's going to have the last word, or even the medium last word. And therefore, we think, what? Well, we think maybe Chief Justice Marshall somehow seized this power, which he didn't. He ratified what people were thinking at the time. Now, remember what they're thinking. They're thinking that the judges, basically, are the least threatening group of people to enforce the boundaries that are in this document. And that's not a bad argument compared to the others. But then there is the question that those African judges and the Asian judges and the Latin American judges asked me, which Hamilton seems not to address. Well, Shakespeare put the question. I love this line. I work for Arthur Goldberg, and it was his favorite line. <laughs> it's when Owen Glendower is saying, typical Welshman, thinks Shakespeare, you know, sort of mystical. <laughs> he says, I can summon spirits from the vasty deep. And Hotspur looks at him and says, well, so can I. So can any man. But will they come when you do call them? <laughs> Indeed, that is the question. And look to see what Hamilton says about that. I found nothing. Nothing. But that question seems to run through case after case after case as we look along the course of American history in the court. Let's look at the founding case. The founding case, Marbury versus Madison. Everyone knows that one. Well, what actually happened in Marbury versus Madison? What happened was the Federalists lost the election of 1800. Terrible. Now Jefferson is running the country. The Republicans are running the country. And Marshall and the Federalists have nothing left but the Supreme Court. And Jefferson has said, each of the three departments has an equal right to decide for itself its duty under the Constitution without regard to what others may have decided under a similar question. That doesn't seem very uh, promising for the doctrine of judicial review. Moreover, Jefferson and the Republicans are worried about the Federalists, and they would like to do them in if they can. The Federalists, by the way, had not behaved impeccably. Just before they went out of office, they did all kinds of things to improve the position of the judiciary, and including appointing a whole lot of new judges. They were called the Midnight Judges. They were Federalists. We will have Federalists now in Federalist positions. This is the last bastion of power. One of the people who was appointed was named Marbury, and Marbury was never delivered his commission. Who was the person who was supposed to deliver the commission? It was John Marshall, actually. John Marshall was Secretary of State at that time. He was on his way to the Supreme Court. I guess in the rush, he forgot to deliver the commission. Marbury didn't get it. We have a new president now, Thomas Jefferson, and a new Secretary of State. And uh, Marbury says, where is my commission to be a judge? And they say, we're not giving it to you, ha, 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 or something to that effect. <laughs> so what did Marbury do? He brought a lawsuit. 
And he said, they have to. I've been appointed. I was appointed by President Adams. I'm entitled to my office. What are they doing not giving me this piece of paper? And now we have the great case, Marbury versus Madison. But where is Marbury going to sue? Are we sure he can find a court that will give him this piece of paper? And now along comes a very, very technical statute which seems as if it is going to give to Marbury the right that he's entitled to. What does this statute say? It says the Supreme Court, says the statute, can issue writs of mandamus in cases warranted by the principles and usages of law to any person holding office under the authority of the United States. That sounds good. And indeed, he sues in the Supreme Court. and. Uh, Marshall and the Supreme Court decide the case. Now, do they give him this? This is a very important decision. Why? Well, the first thing that Marshall says for the court is, is he entitled, is Marbury entitled to the commission under the usages of law? Does law entitle them to the commission? Answer, yes, of course. I mean, he was appointed. He has a five-year term, nothing left to do but hand him a piece of paper. The law entitles him to it. Is this the kind of case that we could, in fact, give order, mandamus, which means do your job? Yes, this is that kind of case. This is a ministerial job. It's just mechanical. It's like we walk into the clerk's office uh, in any kind of marriage bureau or something, say, I want my certificate. Here's the $3. Give it to me. Give him the certificate. Yes, he's entitled to it. There's no politics involved here. This isn't a political decision. And do we have the power to give it to him? Well, this statute says we have the power. The statute says we have the power. Yes, I guess we can give it to him. Ah, but wait. If we look at the Constitution, the Constitution says that we in the Supreme Court can give, take an action, hear a complaint, hear a claim, when, when there is a case, if it was brought here, as this one was, affecting ambassadors, there's no ambassador here, public ministers and councils, none of them, those in which a state shall be a party, nope. Those are the cases where you can bring a, a, a claim directly in the Supreme Court. You're not listed, Mr. Marbury, not listed. And so we have the Constitution not giving us the power to hear your case as an original matter. And we have you entitled to your writ. But do we follow the statute, which seems to entitle you uh, to uh, the writ from us, ordering it? or? Do we follow the Constitution? Now, finally, at the end of this opinion, we're at this great question. Uh, and Jeff Marshall says it's not such a difficult question, not a very difficult question at all. Uh, in fact, if we see the Constitution here and the statute here and there's a conflict, well, we have a written Constitution. This is more powerful and more important uh, than the other. Uh, we have to follow the Constitution. All right, simple. Houdini. Why Houdini? Because who won the case? Jefferson won the case. Now look what Marshall has done. Marshall has said, Jefferson, you violated the law. Marbury, you're entitled to this commission. Uh, but we can't hold you, Mr. President, you can't say you have to give it to him because we don't have the power to do so because the statute giving us the power violates the Constitution. Now, why do I say Houdini? You see, Jefferson thought he had Marshall in a box. How is Marshall going to decide this case? He's either going to decide in Marbury's favor or against Marbury? If he decides against Marbury, he's proved that the court doesn't even have the power to give this poor man that piece of paper, which he's clearly entitled to. 
and he's shown that the court is weak. If, on the other hand, he says, give him the paper, I won't do it. I won't do it. Too bad. And then he's shown it's doubly weak. Now, why do we think more, uh, Jefferson? We don't know Jefferson wouldn't have done it. But we do know Jefferson told Madison, who was the uh, respondent in the case, don't show up. Don't even set foot in court. That gives us a hint. And uh, we know quite a few of the things Jefferson said. So certainly there was quite a threat that Jefferson would not carry out an order of the court. And what Marshall has done is established more power than Jefferson ever thought was likely. He can review acts of Congress and hold them unconstitutional. He said that Marbury is entitled to this piece of paper, but Jefferson wins, so he can't complain. Now, what's the theme that that's illustrating? To me, it's Hotspur's question. It's Hotspur's question. I mean, Marshall doesn't know what's going to happen if he orders Jefferson to give this piece of paper to Mr. Marbury. And he's worried that the court just won't be obeyed. And therefore, Chief Justice Marshall, being worried, calls upon Houdini Marshall to get him out of the jam. And he did. Now, was he right to be worried? All right, let's look at two or three examples. Was he right to be worried? By the way, the court didn't hold another statute unconstitutional. Probably didn't, there's some argument about this, but uh, until this decision of Dred Scott in eight, and then when they held statutes unconstitutional, they did it in quite a big way. I mean, that was a terrible case, but that's many, many years into the future. But they did decide cases that were almost constitutional Cases of the sort we're interested in, cases, for example, involving the Cherokee Indians, where popularity is all on one side, where it's very important, where there are victims, and where the court is going to have to hold under the law in favor of those victims. So let's look at that case for a minute, a case involving the Cherokee Indians. In 1829, 1830, the tribe of Cherokee Indians lived in northern Georgia. Now, they can live there. It's their land. They're guaranteed this land by treaty. And the Constitution says the treaty's just like this one. It says in Article 6, are the supreme law of the land, just like the Constitution is. Oh, the Cherokees aren't worried. By the way, they've abandoned all their hunting and fishing. They have farms. They have an alphabet. They have a constitution. They have a great leader called Chief Ross. And he uh, is uh, civilized in the quotes, uh, I mean, of the uh, uh, period. He would be a civilized person in that period, far more so than his northern uh, Georgia neighbors. And the northern Georgia neighbors are real troublemakers, by the way. One reason was, of course, in 1829, they found gold. Where? In the Cherokee land. Now, they've been behaving reasonably well, the Georgians, till that moment. But once the gold was found, why should they have it, the Indians? Why shouldn't we have it? We're Georgians, they're Indians, and uh, we'll take it. And they marched right in, and they did take it, and they made all kinds of laws governing the Cherokees. Now remember, Chief Ross has a constitution. They're there just indistinguishable from their neighbors as farmers. And he does what any good man or woman with a constitution would do, when in trouble, hire a lawyer. And he hires the great lawyer of the day, Willard Wirt, who was later Attorney General. And Wirt says, don't worry, I've read the Constitution. I've read it. I mean, there's a treaty. I mean, you're entitled to this land. I mean, the Georgians don't have a legal ground to stand on. Fine. Good. What are you going to do, Mr. Wirt? Wirt says, well, I'm going to bring a lawsuit. Now, that's easier said than done. Why? Because the last time there was a lawsuit brought in a similar matter in this particular place involving the Creeks, the Creeks uh, did, in fact, win that tribe. But the Georgians passed a law saying anyone who comes in to execute this uh, order of a court in favor of the Creeks will himself be executed in quite a different way. 
Uh, then there, to show that they meant it, there was a case involving Corn Tassel, who was a Cherokee, and he won too, except before the court order could get to him, they hanged him. Hmm. He's going to have some problems, Mr. Wirt. What is he going to do? Well, the first thing he does is he brings a famous case called Cherokee Indian, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia. And the trouble there is that the Supreme Court found a kind of technicality, an odd interpretation of a jurisdictional point, and didn't decide the case. But then, luckily, for the Cherokees, a missionary from Massachusetts named Worcester came to the Cherokee land, lived there, was trying to help them out, and the governor of Georgia, uh, way ahead of his time, asked him to sign a loyalty oath to, to Georgia, and he wouldn't. And therefore, the governor of Georgia and the Georgian troops put him in jail. Now, here is the case. Wirt's delighted, because it's unlikely they'll execute someone from Massachusetts. Not definite, but probably not, in the same way that uh, uh, they uh, executed corn tassel. But now he has his case, because he can appeal this all the way to the Supreme Court. And he did. And in the Supreme Court, he won. He won. Won the case. Fine. Why not? Let me read you. This is Story, because they didn't, he didn't know. Justice Story, sitting with Justice Marshall. He, say, he wrote to his wife, thanks be to God, the court can wash their hands clean of the iniquity of oppressing the Indians and disregarding their rights. The court has done its duty. Now let the nation do theirs. Good. And he added, that Georgia is full of anger and violence. Probably she will resist. And if she does, I do not believe the president will interfere. Indeed, that's what happened. The president was Andrew Jackson. He did not interfere. He said to the court, in effect, in effect, now no one knows if he really said this, but uh, certainly people think he did, uh, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. And officials in the Jackson administration said lots of things to that effect, such as the president has just as good a right to interpret the Constitution as the Supreme Court, just as good a right, and uh, so why uh, should I bother being president to enforce this piece of paper that the court puts out, and he wouldn't. At that point, Joseph Story, Marshall wrote the story, I yield slowly and reluctantly to the conviction that our Constitution cannot last. Why? Why not? Why was it so important to follow the court? Well, Jackson found out pretty quickly, because South Carolina was observing what would happen. And someone in South Carolina had a really brilliant idea. He said, well, if Georgia doesn't have to pay attention to the court or particular provisions in the Constitution as they interpret it, there are a few others that we would like not to pay attention to, one of them being collecting customs duties and giving them to federal government. So they passed a law saying, don't pay any of the federal customs duties as long as you're in North Carolina. Great idea. Now, even Jackson figured out that was not such a good idea. And at that point, he became a little worried about the situation. He went to Congress, got them to pass a force bill, which meant that he had the power to send troops down to South Carolina. South Carolina saw what was happening and withdrew its law. At that point, what about poor Worcester, who's in jail? The newspapers start writing editorials saying nobody can see the difference between Worcester being in jail in this place and the customs duty in the other place, except for a supporter of Jackson. And uh, uh, Governor of Georgia worked this out. And Jackson worked it out. And they reached an agreement, and Worcester was released from jail. All right, so it has a happy ending, doesn't it? I mean, Worcester's released? No, it doesn't have a happy ending. It doesn't have one bit of a happy ending. What happened next? is that Jackson sent troops. Maybe he should have done this a little earlier, but he sent troops into Georgia. Did he send troops to defend the Indians? No. He sent troops to evict them. He found a handful of people who would sign a treaty agreeing to go, and as soon as the 17,000 others discovered this, they rioted and said, no one wants to leave. Jackson's generals said no one wanted to leave, but uh, Congress ratified this treaty uh, by a vote of one majority, and uh, the troops went down uh, in terrible circumstances, terrible circumstances, and uh, sent the Indians on their way, 
Trail of Tears to Oklahoma, where their descendants live to this day. So if this is a story of Hotspur, I'd say the story is that Hotspur seems to be right. I mean, will they come when you call them? Well, certainly, the court right there had the experience of saying, uh, seeing, no, no. Very unpopular, a few people against the many, and uh, they're in Oklahoma. They're not in Georgia. All right, let's roll the camera forward if you'd like. I'd like to spend some time talking about Dred Scott, but there isn't time, so you have to come to a different lecture, which I will give in April, <laughs> on the, in a different place, in New York, on that subject. <laughs> But uh, roll it forward a little more to where we get to the point where actually uh, I was born. I find this interesting. And uh, a case that I like to contrast, or not contrast, because it's a kind of middle case, is uh, Cooper versus Aaron. Not everyone knows what Cooper versus Aaron is. Cooper versus Aaron came along after Brown versus Board of Education. In Brown versus Board of Education, the court said, and it's so easy in retrospect, in retrospect you look, you say, just open your eyes, look around. There was, in fact, a provision of the Constitution which says all people are entitled to equal protection of the laws. That was passed because we'd had a war in which slavery was abolished, and there were a lot of people who were going to be treated unequally. And Congress did not want them to be treated unequally. They wanted them to be treated equally. And by 1954 and 1955, although there had been some experiments with separate but equal and Plessy v. Ferguson, if you wanted to know what other people were treated equally. If they were African Americans in the South, all you had to do was open your eyes and look. And they weren't. And it was pretty bad. And so finally, in 1954, in Brown, the court got around to saying, hey, here's the Constitution. It says, and uh, maybe it was a little more difficult than that, but it said the idea here is these people will be treated equally, and they're not. Okay? So end. Go. No more segregation. Let's apply the law to everyone alike. And they set ideals in that opinion. It's a pretty good opinion. It's flat in its language. Question, is it separate, but is, is, is it constitutional? Does it violate the Constitution to have segregated schools? No. Yes, it does. It does violate the Constitution. It's simple, and it's clear. And that's because, at least to us, the issue was simple and clear. And it's unanimous. But no. The court has a problem. There's about a third of the country that seems fairly upset about this, and they might not do it. Again, it's Hotspur's problem. And the court then, and people debate the wisdom of this, about a year later, had decided Brown too, and used the famous words, with all deliberate speed, there will in fact be desegregation. That's what will happen next. We'll desegregate with deliberate speed. And we can debate whether it should have said with deliberate speed or it should have said do it now. But they did say deliberate speed. And I don't know it would have made much a difference if they said do it now. Because what happened over the next year was nothing. Nothing happened. Well, not quite nothing. There was desegregation starting in the District of Columbia in a handful of cities. But throughout most of the South, I think it's fair to say nothing at all was happening. In Texas, uh, there was a court order that said that there had to be a beginning of desegregation, and the governor was against it and said, I'm not going to do it, and nothing really happened. Right. So what we have is a great declaration, and we have an opinion that's saying, now we're going to do something and at least begin, and we have happening nothing. Nothing. Well, in 19, by 1957, in Little Rock, a school board, which had not been tremendously in favor of segregation. The school board said, decided that they would begin desegregation. We'll start with the high schools and just a few. One, Central High School. And uh, we'll begin slowly, and then we'll go down to the lower grades, and eventually, a few years from now, uh, we'll have our schools beginning to be desegregated. The NAACP was against that. They thought it was too slow. The court said, it's good enough, begin. And there were court orders to say that in September, in September of 1957, there will be some black students in that white school. Some of you can remember that. 
There were nine students. They were called the Little Rock Nine. They were pretty brave. They were chosen particularly because they were brave. <laughs> And because they were, they, were, uh, they, they were intelligent, they did a good job in school, they lived not too far away, they satisfied a lot of criteria, and so the court said, them, they're the ones. They should enter Little Rock High School when it opens in September. Hmm. Well, easier said than done. Why? Because there were a lot of things going on in Little Rock at that time. There were, there, in Congress, the representatives of the South were saying that the Supreme Court decision was totally illegal. They wrote something called the Southern Manifesto, which said the court has no business doing this. There were white citizens' councils that said the state should interpose itself between the court and the order, whatever that meant. It sounded quite good. It meant that the state wouldn't do it. There were people who were threatening violence. There were threats and there was violence. There were lynchings in Mississippi, Emmett Till being a famous one. Uh, it was a bad situation. But the little, school, the little Rock School Board had said, we are going to go ahead and, hold and integrate Little Rock's Central High School beginning September 3rd, 1957. Now what happened? Governor Faubus, who had not been elected as a great segregationist. He'd been sort of middle of the road. He became convinced that segregation was the key to his political future, I suppose. And on August 29th, he went to a state court and got the state court to order the federal court not to order the school integration. Well, that worked for about three days. Then the NAACP went back to the federal court and they set that aside. Still, it's now February, it's now uh, September 3rd. The uh, federal court says we ought to wait a couple of days here until things settle down. They were trying to coordinate the entry. Everyone got the word except Elizabeth Eckford, who didn't have a telephone, who was one of Little Rock Nine. And she showed up at the high school in the morning, and there was a big crowd outside. And uh, it was news all over the world. And someone took a picture, and it's a famous picture. She's walking very dignified, and behind her, there is a white woman whose face is absolutely contorted in rage. And that picture went around the world. And they said, this is, this is segregation or desegregation or integration, we don't know which, uh, whatever is happening in Little Rock in the United States. On Thursday, the federal court said, I want the FBI and the Department of Justice to show up in my court to see if the governor is really helping enforce this order or hindering. The governor sent the National Guard. He didn't send the National Guard to help with integration. He sent the National Guard to try to prevent the integration. Well, at this point, there was a congressman from Little Brock, Hayes um, Brooks. And uh, he was a kind of moderate. And he knew Eisenhower, who was president. And he said, let's set up a meeting here between the governor and the president. Governor Faubus flew off to meet with the president at Newport. And as he later described it, he said, the president dressed me down like an army captain addressing a lieutenant or a private. And I didn't like it. <laughs> He might not have liked it, but he gave President Eisenhower the impression that he would go along and see that the school was integrated. Then he went out of the room, and he gave the newspapers a different impression. And President Eisenhower didn't like that very much. He thought that wasn't a very particularly good way to behave. So we have a governor who says, I have the troops. And I've told them not to let anybody in the school. And when the federal court orders me to withdraw the troops, which it did, I'll withdraw them. And now all we have is a school in the middle of Arkansas, surrounded by 1,500 white citizen council members and various other troublemakers. And into this school, these nine students are supposed to walk. Well, what happened over the next week or so was nobody did anything. I mean, you're not going to send the nine students, no matter how brave they are, into that school. 
Eisenhower is thinking, what should I do? Now, what's interesting is to read how he was advised. Jimmy Burns, who was the former governor of South Carolina, former member of the Supreme Court, a great friend of Harry Truman, and uh, uh, very active in World War II, flew up to talk to Eisenhower, and he said to Eisenhower, you cannot intervene. If you intervene, you're going to have to have the second reconstruction of the South. You are going to see somebody will get hurt. You won't know how to get the troops out of there. There'll be violence. They'll close the schools. If they close the schools, nobody will get educated. And he was pretty strong, apparently, about not doing anything. Eisenhower saw Brownell, his attorney general, his wise counselor. And Brownell said, you have to do something now. Because what's at stake is the rule of law. Now, people debate how much. I think there are two sides to this debate after reading quite a lot about it about how much Eisenhower was really in favor of integration. I mean, he might well have been very much in favor of it. He did integrate. He liked to lead through example. Uh, and people who know him said that he started out in a segregated society. But during World War II, he was impressed by uh, some of these divisions in the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, he thought, this is an absurd thing, this segregation. And he, would, and he did uh, then integrate the District of Columbia. But Chief Justice Warren thought that he never strongly enough supported the moral point. Maybe, I don't know. But I do know that the point that was going to get him the most support was the support about rule of federal law. Federal law, supreme. And what he did is he said, I'm going to send the 101st Airborne. Now, we who were born then, and those older than me, know who these people were. The 101st Airborne, they were the divisions that had invaded Normandy, that had fought in the Battle of the Bulge. There were pictures in Life magazine, which I can remember, showing some of those people with their parachutes open, hung up on steeples in Normandy where they just were shot down because they didn't land in quite the right place. They were heroes. And so when he chose the 101st Airborne, he knew he, he was choosing. And what Eisenhower did about a week later, September 23rd, this is the order, I like the order. I'll read you the order. As President of the United States, under and by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Constitution, I do command all persons engaged in such obstruction of justice to cease and desist therefrom and to disperse forthwith. That's what he read over the radio so that the people in the citizens' councils around the high schools could hear it. And then he sent the 101st Airborne, 52 aircraft, carrying about 1,000 troops. They came from Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and they landed. They landed in Little Rock. And the next day, there's a new picture. And the new picture that went around the world is the picture of those troops, the 101st Airborne, taking those children into that white school. Fabulous. Fabulous. Fabulous day for law in America. Fabulous. But I have to tell you, it doesn't have quite the happy ending that I'd like it to have if, in fact, I could only end here. Because I can't end here. What happened next was, in fact, things went fairly well for a couple of months. A lot of the kids wouldn't speak. They were told by their parents, don't talk to the black students. Some broke that down. The teachers mostly tried to help. Some didn't. Uh, it worked medium. Uh, the kids were sticking it out. Uh, one got a little annoyed and threw a bowl of chili over somebody else's head, which I don't blame her for. But by and large, it was, uh, it was OK. Then, of course, Eisenhower had to withdraw the troops at some point. And he did, after a couple of months. And pretty soon, who knows? A lot of instigating going on. But the white citizens' councils were still there. There was a lot of pressure on the board. All kinds of things are going on in Little Rock. And before you know it, the board comes up with a plan to postpone the whole thing for another couple of years. And that case gets into the court. And eventually, it goes through the courts. And then, after the event, it gets to the Supreme Court. And there's the case of Cooper versus Aaron. Now, the Supreme Court's in Washington. They're not in Little Rock, in Central High School. 
And they have a huge debate. And still, it's a great case. It's a great case. Why, is, why, do, I get so, why do I get excited about this case? Because nine justices, all, signed an opinion about what should happen next. And they said, of course you're not going to postpone this. It isn't even close. You're not going to postpone it. No. And they wrote down. They wrote down several propositions of law. I'll read you one. This decision declared the basic principle, which decision? Brown. That the federal judiciary is supreme in the exposition of the law of the Constitution. And that principle, supreme? That's the first time this appears. It didn't appear in Marbury. It didn't appear as who was to have the last word. Here is where it appears. You see, Marbury says, in this case, we decide this. The Constitution trumps the statute. But it didn't say what would happen in a similar case that didn't get to the Supreme Court. And it didn't say that others had to follow it. But now the court says the federal judiciary is supreme in the exposition of the law of the Constitution. And the court was criticized a lot for having said that. Well. I think used to be criticized a lot more than now. I'm not going to be criticized by me. Why? Because I'm sitting there and saying, well, what in heaven is anybody supposed to do? What are they supposed to do? They've just, in fact, declared two years sooner that there isn't going to be any more segregation in the United States, that one third of the country is really not just out to lunch, but beyond that. And they've got to change their ways. And of course, I mean, I can't imagine them saying, and by the way, it's all up to somebody else. I mean, whether, whether this really is the law or not in analogous cases, they can't say something like that. If they're under an obligation to see that this law, as they've interpreted this law, as they understand it in the Constitution, really is the law of the United States. Hotspur's question. Hotspur's question. And they had huge debates then about where to go from that. What shall we actually do? Black was saying, say now, now, now. Everybody desegregates now. Frankfurter said they've discovered his papers. It's so interesting. He said, no, no, don't say anything quite that radical. The way we're going, the way we're going to get this done is we are going to appeal through reason to the graduates of the Harvard Law School throughout the South. That absolutely, absolutely true. Yeah. There we are. Uh, I mean, that's one way. That's possible. But 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 uh, this is the con how do we go? And you can read their debates. How do we bring this about? How do we bring this about? I'm not sure. How do we bring this about? Did it help to have nine? Yes, I'm sure it did. They reaffirm Brown. Were rumors around. They said that Brown isn't really the law. All nine of us say it's the law. There are rumors around that people can have private schools or all kinds of other ways of getting out of this. We say they can't. There are rumors around that what we say is not absolutely supreme and definite in interpreting the law. Well, it is. And all nine of us agree. Well, wait a minute. Is, why is this ringing a little hollow? Because I have to say nine. And remember our nine or 900 or 9,000? And what happened next? What happened next? They issued that opinion. And what happened the next day? They closed the school. Closed. None of the children went to school. And that was a lost year that year for the children at Central High. Lost. Black and white. And a lot of them were hurt. A lot of them were hurt. Uh, they didn't go to college. They, uh, the football team all wrote many, many, many years later about what had happened that year to them individually. Very interesting article. A lot of sad things happened to them. And uh, some good, some good. That woman with her face enraged, she and Elizabeth Eckford, the, the black girl, they spent in later years touring the country talking about redemption. <laughs> That's nice. I like that. I mean. Yes, you can. It's possible. And uh, some good things came out of that. But basically what happened over the next year is that school was closed until 
People in Little Rock got fed up with not having a school. And they voted for a school board that would reopen the school. And it was close, but they voted for it. And eventually, the school board the next year did reopen the school. And it was, in fact, integrated. So what can you say about sending these troops? You have to have a subjective reaction. My subjective reaction, which I can't prove, and it comes maybe sitting in my seat or whatever, fabulous, fabulous. It helped to turn a tide. Do I know that? No, because there was so much. 1955 was the year that Rosa Parks sat in the bus. There was, there was a lot that went on besides what went on in the Supreme Court. There was a great deal set into motion and much had to be done before progress was made. But it was made. It was made. And so what I see, that troop being sent, a fabulous symbol, a fabulous symbol, a symbol that the President of the United States would support the court and would support the court when, in fact, the court made a declaration of law, even where it was tough politically to do so, and two-thirds of the South would have voted against him just because of that. The North was for him, but we don't know with the same strength. And uh, Brownell, great. Thank you, Mr. Brownell. And I do see that as a great day for American law. Not quite as definite as the judges in Cooper v. Aaron thought, I mean, that they would just achieve what they wanted, because they didn't. But still, in those two photos, the one with the woman's face filled with rage, and the other with the children being walked into the school, in those two photos, I see that as a fulcrum, as a turning point, as a stage in a direction, a direction that law will prevail in America, including law that does much of what the Constitution does, which is to offer protections for people who are not popular offer protections for people who are not in the majority, and offer protections for people in circumstances where all of the votes would go the other way. In a, well, it's in a sense, if you want to be a little over dramatic about it, President Eisenhower is vindicating Hamilton. I mean, the decision not to put this power in the legislature. But all that's debatable. I'm just telling a story. Very biased, but nonetheless telling the story. Now, very briefly, take one other case. Final case. And you choose. You choose. Which one do you want? Abortion? That's a good one. Feelings rise, really rise. Yeah, I was coming to that. <laughs> Bush v. Gore. That's a great one. That is a great one for this point. A very good case for this point. Couldn't be better. The election's turning on a knife edge. It looks as if Gore has won a few more popular votes, but the system is the electoral votes. And after all, the Electoral College is a mirror of Congress, Senate and House together. And each state is to choose its electors in the manner that the legislature of that state shall decide. And Florida is exactly divided. My goodness, it's close. And Bush is slightly ahead. And now someone, not me, <laughs> decides to file a paper and ask the Supreme Court to review it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, there were issues in that case. Three members of the court, not me, thought that the Florida Supreme Court, in asking for a recount, demanding a recount, ordering a recount, had so departed from the statute of Florida that it violated the proposition that said, the legislature of Florida shall decide how to do this, because it was the judges of Florida. Now, when I wrote about that, I was in dissent in that case. I said, if you think that their decision is not a normal judicial decision down there in Florida, you haven't seen as many decisions as I have. I mean, they're all over the place, and judges come to different conclusions on different matters. But that was dissent. 
Three thought it departed too far. More than three thought, and indeed I thought this, that, that if they're going to recount the whole state, they should have a single standard. And they shouldn't have one county doing it one way, another county doing it another way. That's a debatable proposition. But the key in this was the third point, is, is Florida going to be allowed to continue? Five said no. They could not continue the recount. Four said yes. I was in the four. Did I feel strongly about it? Well, you never know, because for a judge to feel strongly about something, you know, it, look, this is, it's not exactly the most emotional thing. But I did, I did write. I didn't think we should take this case. Having taken it, I think we should dismiss it. And uh, if we aren't going to dismiss it, we should at least decide it correctly and let them continue with the recount. That was the view of four. But the view of five was different. And indeed, I said it was a, referring back to what others had said about Dred Scott, the self-inflicted wound. That's pretty strong, pretty strong. So I felt strongly, sure, for a judge. Did people in the country feel strongly? Yes, very strongly, very strongly. And yet I heard Harry Reid, our Senate majority reader, who is a Democrat, say this about the case. And I agree with him. He said the most remarkable thing about that case is a point that is very rarely remarked. And that is despite the feelings that many of you may have had, that people all over the country had, that this opinion is completely wrong. I thought it was wrong. Despite that view, despite those feelings, there were no mobs in the streets. There were no guns. There were no revolutions. There weren't paving stones being thrown at people. It was accepted. And when Harry Reid said that, he was thinking, this is, oh my goodness, but this is, yes, even here. It is an example of how 300 million people in the United States have learned a way to get along under law even when they think it's wrong. And that's when it counts. No, even when they think it's wrong and when it really might be wrong. Wow. And he's thinking that characteristic, which is what I think, is a national treasure. That's something that helps 300 million people live together. Those 300 million I began with. Those 300 million who are there represented in that court. And as tough as it is to say that, my goodness, that was so wrong. Somebody should have done something about it. The day you start thinking, and with guns, and with mobs, and with wars, that happens in many countries. And in our country, too, that happened at one point. And maybe that was a good thing at that point. You say, these things are not easy. but. And balance, yes, it's a treasure, it's a treasure. And we've seen that come to the point where the second most interesting thing that Harry Reid said to me were the words, and yet not often remarked, and yet not often remarked upon. Yes, not, we just breathe it like the air. Oh, we didn't think of that. We didn't think, my goodness, we accepted it. We thought it was oh, awful, but we went along and accepted it. And Vice President Gore said to his staff, I saw on television, don't trash the court. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and that's not personal. That's not personal. If you don't, you have to say the same as me. The same, identical. I'm just there as a trustee. You see? Now, there we are. A few little cases brought out, starting with that Marbury and Madison and Hamilton and Hotspur's question. And what's interesting to me about the cases is both the development, but how, die, how, much, how un much uncertainty there is in those. I'm so glad we come up with Bush v. Gore, because it's a beautiful test case for what you really think, what you think should have happened, for how hard it is and perhaps, in my view, how necessary it is for us to live together in 
one country under law, under this document, even with a court that quite often may make mistakes. There we are. There we are. All right. Now, that's the introduction. <laughs> and I'm saying to you, I can't bring this about, this situation that you've talked about, that I've talked about. You are the ones who will bring it about. That's what I want to tell those African judges. I want to tell that to the Latin Americans. I want to tell that to the Asians. Don't talk to me. Talk to your own people. It's a question of education. It's a question of habit. It's a question of history. It's a question of learning how to get on with people who think differently and govern your differences under law. That's what this first lecture has been. Having said that, I don't think really the court has nothing to do with it. If the people has an obligation, and I think they do, as we've been talking about, so does the court, in my opinion, have an obligation. To what? To help create what this was about so far. Let's call it a workable constitution. But that obligation and how you do it is the subject of tomorrow's lecture.